Good evening. Welcome to AAAS. I, I'm sorry, we're not distributing candy this evening, but we very much appreciate your coming and not going out and trick-or-treating. You can do that later on. Anyway, I'm Norman Newrider, and I'm the senior advisor in our Center for Science Diplomacy here at AAAS. Now, this evening's exciting program is really has quadrilateral sponsorship. It's AAAS, it's the Austrian Embassy, it's the National Academy of Sciences, and it's IASA, the International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis, located in, in Luxembourg, uh, Austria, a suburb of Vienna. Now, for, for full disclosure, I'm also the, uh, the chairman of the trustees of the endowment fund for IASA. So any of you who want to make donations or even discuss them, be sure to talk with me later on this evening, right? Now, just a word about IASA. It's a fascinating institution. It was started in 1972 as a peaceful bridge of activity between the United States and the Soviet Union. It, it uh, began in the, in the Lyndon Johnson White House and then was completed and established uh, in 1972 under President Nixon. And then when the wall came down, when the Soviet Union imploded, that basic core mission of building a peaceful bridge to the Soviet Union uh, was, no longer, was no longer really valid. <coughs> valid. And so it has taken on uh, many new members, China, uh, China, uh, India, Korea, Brazil, and a number of developing countries. And so there's really a kind of development relationship of IASA these days, kind of a north-south orientation of the organization. But that core mission to apply systems analytical techniques to the sort of big issues of the world, you know, food, water, poverty, and particularly energy, that core mission still exists and is very much what the institution is involved in today. Now, to introduce this evening's speaker, it's a, uh, it's a great pleasure to introduce uh, Holmes Hummel, Ms. Holmes Hummel from the Department of Energy's Office of Policy and International Affairs, where she has, where she has the impressive title of Senior Policy Advisor. She's been deep into this climate business for a long time, haven't you? you? You were a congressional fellow where you got sort of hooked on the issue. You spent a summer as a, in, the, in the Young Scientist Summer Program at IASA actually working with, uh, with our, our principal speaker this evening. And what really impressed me, well, not only are you one of the first PhDs in that resources and, and climate program at Stanford, but while, while at Clarkson University, you, add, you actually were the co-leader of the team that built a solar-powered car that raced all the way across the country. And I assume from your biography that you actually made it. It's a great pleasure. <laughs> it's a great pleasure to introduce Holmes Hummel, to introduce our speaker. Good evening, everyone. Happy Halloween. <laughs> Trick or treat. I think we're in for a treat. I'm sure we're in for a treat. Uh, I, I did actually, good gracious, I need to grow a few inches to stand behind this big lectern. Um, I did travel to Austria in the summer of 2004, uh, a beneficiary of the National Academies of Sciences sponsorship of YASA and specifically the Young Scientist Summer Program. And it was in that capacity that I actually uh, had the opportunity to study with uh, our speaker this evening. Uh, Naki or Novosa Nakachinovich was leading the greenhouse gas working group at YASA. And uh, I had the opportunity to do some of the most sophisticated interdisciplinary analysis and research that I've encountered in any academic institution in the world. In, in that capacity, I came to realize that Naki was leading a team that asked some of the most important types of policy questions. For instance, do we know the size and scale of some of the problems that we face? And do we know what options we have that would be responsive on a scale that matters and in a time frame that can make a difference? His work with scenario analysis has inspired a generation of analysts that I call my peers, and they are people who have been informed by his work, working on complex interactions between multiple drivers of both cause and effect, and his commitment to data-driven analysis has kept us focused and directed in our leading and 
ever-changing lines of inquiry. I also respect Naki for his contributions to our field through policy engagement, uh, a commitment to making his work accessible to the rest of us. And now, of course, that I serve in a capacity where I depend so deeply on international scholars uh, and all of the insights that Yasa can offer, uh, I've never appreciated it more that he is so fluently able to integrate the demands of energy sufficiency around the world, the demand for energy security around the world, and, of course, our world's demand for life support systems to be sustained by the choices we make on the quest, in the quest for prosperity. With that, I'll introduce formerly Professor Nakachinovich as the Deputy Director of the Institute, uh, International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis and the Director of the Global Energy Assessment. And among his many international roles, he is a member of the technical group of the United Nations Secretary General's high-level group on sustainable energy for all. He's also a member of the Advisory Council of the German Government on Global Change and a member of the Renewable Energy Policy Network for the 21st Century, which produces a report I'm sure you've all depended upon in your own work, the REN21 Global Status Report. Naki is a lead author of the fifth assessment report of the IPCC, uh, which only covers up the fact that he was already a coordinating lead author of the IPCC's second, third, and fourth assessment reports, and of course one of the lead authors of the epic and enduring special report on emission scenarios. With that, would you please warmly welcome Professor Nakachinovich for this evening's address. Thank you. Good evening. It's really great to be here, and it's a privilege. I have to admit I'm a bit humbled by the two great introductions from Norm and Holmes. Um, and um, I'm also, I have to say, really impressed that so many could come on the Halloween evening. I think this is, this is a special treat for me. And I was speaking last night with Don Sari, who is there, my colleague Don Sari, who is in the audience. And I promised to him I will not tell you a scary story about energy even though I think one could argue that some of the things that are going on are a little bit scary. But I would like to focus a little bit more on an optimistic outlook. Let's call it optimistic outlook about the future. And if you notice, the subtitle I chose was about efficiency and decarbonization, and I called it revolution. Now, I'm not referring here to some grand destructions of everything we have, but revolution more in symbolic, symbolic sense. The humanity has gone through what we call nowadays two great civilization revolutions. The first one was the Neolithic that brought us from hunters and gatherers to agricultural society and lasted probably 5,000 to 10,000 years. And then the Industrial Revolution that actually brought us in this incredible level of affluence that we have today. And I think in, as, as a metaphor, I think we are in front of a next revolution toward more sustainable development. And I think in energy, that refers to efficiency and decarbonization. So that's basically what my talk is about. And I would like to make four points um, at, at the beginning. I think there is an increasing awareness around the world that energy is really a crucial entry point for dealing with many of the challenges we are facing in this century. And th this was probably one of the problems over, over the last 20 years, that energy was in the background in the days of relatively low prices. We have neglected energy, both from the point of view of R&D and from the policies. Energy is not even part of the Millennium Development Goals. And I think now is a huge opportunity uh, to change that. Um, number two that I would like to address in some detail is the issue of what I call access. Um, about three billion people today in the world do not have the benefits of modern energy services that we are enjoying and find completely natural. When I arrived here on, on Saturday uh, with, and visited with Tom Schelling and Alice, their house was in darkness and it was very inconvenient. We forget how important energy is. And even if you lose it for a short time, it is exceedingly inconvenient. But three billion people live all the time in, in the darkness in our, in our language. Um, so we need energy transformation for that. And um, also we need energy transformation where we live to use energy more efficiently and decarbonize. That's the main hypothesis I'm putting. And I would like to show you that that can bring many multiple benefits. It goes beyond energy for development in general, for human health, for security, and even for climate change. But the major challenge, I think, ahead of us is how to secure the financing. And 
I will conclude with the financing requirements. I think it's conceivable that we could do it if we get together and do the right policies, and I think this is why we have homes at the right place to help us achieve, achieve the right policies. Now, let me just say briefly that much of what I will say is based on the global energy assessment. I will not present it to you. We are completing it over the end of the year. It involves about 300 authors around the world that do this work pro bono and 200 anonymous reviewers. And what I will present to you is some of the findings of my colleagues from IASA who have contributed to the global energy assessment. Now, I, you might think this is a very unconventional way to start a talk. Uh, it's, it's a chart that goes back to 18... 28. Uh, Mr. Henry Palmer, that's his vision of the railway. Henry Palmer was actually quite a big innovator. He, he designed the first monorails, but his original idea, of course, would, that they would have been pulled by horses. But then, as you see, he got much more imaginative and was thinking of the wind power, a monorail powered by wind. If that actually occurred, if that fantasy was realistic, maybe we would have been in a better situation today. But as you know, that's a tall order even today, and certainly then it was almost impossible to do. So that's the main caveat I want to make in front of my presentation. I think even if you get things right in principle, in detail, it's going to be wrong. The deep uncertainty about future cannot be avoided even, I think, when one works with many scenarios. And the irony of this vision is, if you notice the year 1828, in 26, the Darlington Stockton Railway was already operating on steam, and he obviously missed that idea. And then the first monorails, of course, were powered by steam. And um, this is also the story of my talk. So let me show you one of the longest time series about the technology that we have. Uh, it is from the work of UK and Pearson, because UK has been documented quite well. And this is an economic perspective. This shows you the cost of a passenger kilometer over the last 350 years in travel. And you might recall, also in this country, much of the travel was on the stagecoach or on the horse itself. And what you will find here is quite amazing that over this period of about 200 years, the cost of the stagecoach travel went down by a factor of 20. And, you know, many of us would think that stagecoaches were, const you know, not that technologically exciting, but there were many, many innovations to get that, the cost down and the system, and there are many institutional arrangements. I will not go into the details, but this is something what I would imagine we need to do some of the, in the energy efficiency and decarbonization area. Get the cost down so that those technologies become affordable. And that's really what my talk is about. And you can see that this gradual improvement of the stagecoach brought brought us down for about four pence per kilometer hour. And then when the railways came, there was a huge push. You can hardly see the railways, and our cars are even cheaper. So that's the technology story. And I would like to tell my story a little bit against the backdrop of what one could characterize as megatrends. At least there are very powerful developments that I think we have to consider when we look into the future. This is a graphic based of my colleagues on IASA, Wolfgang Lutz and his group, and he spoke here in March about human capacity and demographic changes. All I'm showing you here is that according to their estimates, about half of the global population, 50% of the people in the world, already have elementary education. And this is hopefully going to continue along this projected S-curve, meaning that by the middle of the century, virtually everybody will have basic education, meaning they would be empowered, they would be in much better position to make decisions, start new businesses, and in general, launch on the development program. Now, as a coincidence, it turns out that about 50% of the people in the world also live in democratic order, and that might be a surprise to some. This is based on the word of George Modelsky, who calculates the percentage of people who are living in democracies, and now with the Maghreb spring, this might increase, and hopefully we will be on that trend. So people are more empowered because they know more and they have more possibilities of expressing themselves in pluralistic societies. So I think that's very important when we think about energy futures. And then last but not least, and that's also uh, one of the focal areas of global energy assessment, is the powerful urbanization trend in the world. About half of the global population also lives in the cities, and almost all all projections indicate that the population, the cities, will be doubling over the next decades, from about 
over 3 billion today to 6 billion plus, that the rural population would stay roughly at the current level. So that's a fundamental change. And from the energy point of view, uh, that makes a huge difference because today about 80% of global energy is going into the cities because this is where people use more energy. And so energy has to be concentrated to go to the urban areas, basically. So let me then in my talk with this background start talking, showing you a little bit about the access to energy. And uh, I will talk mostly about energy, but I think we shouldn't forget that these people who do not have energy services also do not enjoy other ecosystem services. They usually lack water. They certainly lack, lack uh, nourishment and food. So that's one of the big challenges. I just want to show you two of my favorite pictures before, before I show you something a little bit more substantive. Um, these are pictures from Peter Menzel, who photographs people either with all of their belongings. They're very interesting. This is a picture with people with all of their food for a week, a refugee family in Darfur. You can clearly see vegetarian diet, one bottle of water, some, bottle, some canisters in the back that need to be purified, and children and women were probably spending hours collecting little fuel wood to cook the vegetarian food, to get the calories out. Uh, so I don't need to tell you more, more about that story, but uh, you're probably aware that some people also claim that the tragedy in Darfur has little, a lot to do with the drying up there, that it's very difficult to have agricultural production. So these are the people that we need to pull out of poverty over the coming decades. And to a large extent, I would argue that's an energy story. And then in comparison, and that's why I like these pictures, uh, a family in Germany, I wonder how it looks at your homes, maybe not all that different. Just look how much water, you know, fruits that embody energy that come from, uh, from usually from the arid areas. And then one point, if you, if you look, if you look at these two families, you know, the Germans don't look to be all that much happier, I think, if you... <laughs> And I think that's a problem with most of us when you have to think, you know, how to throw half of the food in the fridge away. That's the problem. Most of this is thrown away. And so it's a story of too much and too little. And let me just show it to you now a little bit more scientifically. This map shows where those people actually live who do not have access to energy and who have the lifestyles like the family in Darfur. In particular, the red region in nor northern Indian subcontinent um, it's relatively easy to, to read the map. Let me just guide it to you. So reddish colors on the scale down. These are the people who do not have access to electricity. That means not even in the village. And these are the people who have to cook with solid fuel. So all of the food, like the family in Darfur. Uh, usually vegetarian food. Um, then you can look, if you go over and look at China, uh, there electricity access already exists. This is one of the great things that China has achieved, but so did Brazil and South Africa. Uh, but nevertheless, people still have to cook with solid fuels, and in China it's primarily coal, so it's not even in even biomass. And then the sub-Saharan Africa, partial access, sort of brownish color, Par partial access to electricity and, and uh, most of the people uh, cooking with solid fuels. So together in the world we have uh, 3 billion cooking with solid fuels, half a billion in, mostly in China uh, with, with coal, and about 1.5 billion who have no access to electricity. So those are the poorest. And that's one of the biggest development challenges. Let me just show you how the reality looks like of these people because, you know, it's Difficult to internalize that. So here's a person down there with a horse cart and a generator. He goes from village to village. They're charging up the mobile phones. They cannot, these people cannot exist with no, without mobile phones. Uh, they are, you know, ir irrigating with buckets. At night, there is a kerosene light, both dangerous and not very good for reading. Uh, certainly not suitable for education. But the point is, if you look at these mobile phones that are charging off, let's say, one kilo of a generator, that's a few dollars per kilowatt hour. And if you look at your electricity bill, you see that we are rich and we also pay very little compared to those people. In sub-Saharan Africa, one estimates that people on average who even have access to electricity pay on the order of maybe 50 cents per kilowatt hour. So for them, new decentralized photovoltaic systems would be economic and economically attractive. 
So that's one side of the story. The other side of the story is those of us who consume quite a lot and have very high energy needs. We are also producing many pollutants, including the carbon dioxide. And this picture, this graphic shows the history of carbon dioxide emissions and other greenhouse gases in equivalent terms. So going from 1900 to today, you see about a 2% growth per year. And then what might happen in the future? Well, the dashed line, the dotted line that goes up and up and up, that's kind of a, I call it counterfactual. That's what some people call business as usual. I don't think there's any business as usual going that pathway. world will be certainly much different. But there are alternative ways, and I will talk about that, that look very challenging. Those are the green curves, as you can see, curving through the maximum and then going down. Uh, so if you want to achieve, for example, two degrees, the peak needs to be more almost imminent, and you can see how challenging that is today because emissions are growing. Then by the middle of the century, we might have to reduce emissions between one-third to two-thirds compared to today. And then if we don't do enough of that, we might be uh, faced with the possibility of having to produce what some people call negative emissions, for example, taking sustainable biomass or carbon capture and storage and storing carbon, thereby removing it from the atmosphere as the new biomass grows. And, and basically, I think the picture to imagine is that we have a kind of a, a constant future budget of what we can emit. It is on the order of about 750 billion tons of carbon equivalent for a two-degree stabilization. If you want to go to three degrees, then you can emit a little bit more. So the longer we wait, the, war, the more we offshore. Uh, overshoot this target, the lower the negative emissions would have to be, and that's exceedingly difficult to imagine from the current perspective. And, and it's a curious symmetry, the, because for the two degrees, we have emitted in the past what we are still allowed to emit in the future. And that means we would be halfway through the decarbonization era if we were to achieve that goal. Now, how easy it is to achieve that goal, I would like to show you hydrocarbon resources from a slightly different perspective, just that you can mash up this number. So the carbon budget might be on the order of 750 billion tons. If I convert reserves of oil and gas into carbon dioxide that would be emitted if we burn it all up, if you take the upper numbers, it would be, if you add them together, about 1,500 uh, billion tons. So twice as much as our budget, that alone. Um, but conceivably, we could burn it all because only about half stays in the atmosphere. Uh, then the biomass above the ground is also about 1,500, coincidentally the same amount, roughly speaking. Atmosphere has 3,000. So you can see that if you were going to burn all of the biomass and all of the reserves, which are economically uh, ex uh, extractable today, we would be extracting as much carbon as there is in the atmosphere that's already causing the warming that we have. I will skip the soils. Then there are tar sands, huge amount of carbon in tar sands, about the same amount, about 1,500 billion tons. And here are the gas shales that in this country are becoming a commercial source of energy. But gas shales are, exist around the world, and I think that would not be necessarily the worst alternative because gas has half of the emissions of coal, and it's much more efficient, so it would be, be consistent with the paradigm I'm proposing, efficiency and decarbonization. And natural gas combines also well with both nuclear and renewables. I will say a few things about that later. This is coal. So if you're going to use much of our coal endowment, clearly we have to be very clever what to do with the carbon. And these are methane hydrates. We don't know really how, many they, how much they are. That's natural gas frozen in ice under, in permafrost regions and under the oceans. That number might be as large as everything else together. And that, that is a potential climate risk as well if we continue warming up. So one road forward is to use some of these fossils and decarbonize them with CCS. The other road is to use nuclear. And the third broad set of options is to switch to renewables, what we did before the Industrial Revolution. And this is, I think, a very interesting analysis of Europe. And it's not by coincidence that I'm showing you Europe, because Europe has a very high energy density. 
And so you would imagine, because of the high energy density, that you cannot do all that much with, with renewables. Now, if you look at the, at the areas that are sort of between blue and gray, and in particular Scandinavia, that would be more similar to the conditions in this country, relatively low average population density. In all of those areas, the amount of energy you need per square meter to sustain our levels of affluence is, is smaller than the amount of wind and solar one could harness over the same area. So about 20 to 30 percent of Europe, even today, could be supplied by off-grid decentralized systems. We, of course, wouldn't do that. We are talking about smart grids to combine mobility with households, and you certainly need some connection to the grid. On the other hand, all of the urban areas, and that's the challenge as the globe continues to urbanize, that are shown in yellow and red, they need huge concentration of energy because by a large factor we exceed what can be harvested through nature. So for that, so you can see that we need both centralized and decentralized system that requires huge investments in the future. And let me just show you schematically something I really like a lot. Maybe some of you have heard about the idea that comes from Germany that's called uh, sol solar tech. The idea was to build solar power plants in Sahara and take the energy to Europe. Uh, one would be in Sahara, one would need about two, two time, uh, hun, uh, uh, 200 times 200 miles area to produce all of the global electricity. So, you know, it sounds little, but think of 200 miles of solar power plants. So it would be huge. Now, this is an alternative proposal from North Africa. They don't have water, so the red lines show a water pipeline going from the Mediterranean. They would fill the old salt seas in the Sahara, that's the blue, and then they would build solar power plants and combine it with local natural gas fields to produce an integrated system of providing desalinized water for agriculture, for productive uses, as well as electricity. And what I like is, as you can see, it goes to sub-Sahara. It certainly goes to the Sahel region where you saw those refugees. Maybe that can make a big difference. Difference. If we build a system, then one day it could also go to Europe. And these kind of possibilities exist on all of the continents. So that's the other side of the scale, if you go that well. And, you know, I see Jerry here. He's the originator of the Helio strategy going so For you, this is a little bit of a deja vu. He was thinking about these continental scale renewable systems already then, and I had the pleasure of, of working with him as a research assistant. Um, so let me go to my second point. Um, decarbonization then is required. If you're going to use fossils, we need to de decarbonize, and I would argue that brings multiple benefits. So let me show you some of the scenarios very quickly that actually decarbonize. Uh, this is the current picture of the energy in the world. You can see that the Industrial Revolution, coal replacing traditional biomass shown in green, and then oil and gas growing exponentially, uh, providing about 80% of the world in, uh, energy in the world today. On top, you can see nuclear and, and, and hydropower, and very little of the modern renewables, about 1%, and below is the biomass, still mostly traditional biomass for those 2.5 billion people I was talking about. Now, here's a possible scenario about the future that brings, in my view, many co-benefits. Colleagues have designed it in such a way that it provides full access to all of these 3 billion people in 20 years from now. How can it be done? Well, with massive changes. Number one is we would have to improve efficiency very, very drastically compared to a, a you know, hypothetical baseline. So about 40% efficiency improvement in the system, um, about 30% renewables in this scenario. That means that, you know, 70% would be still non-renewable. If, if you subtract nuclear, then we would have maybe 60% of the fossils. So it's not a complete phase change, but incredibly challenging from today's perspective. Then another sensitivity analysis, what if we have to do it without nuclear? How would that work? Is it possible? So that's one change case. <coughs> and as you can see, oil achieves a peak, even though we are not exhausting the every last drop. Uh, this is because mobility changes to electric mobility, for example, because of the many, many electric, electric cars around and so on. Um, now, but there, there are other possibilities of doing that, and I would like to show you an alternative scenario that fulfills similar objectives. In this one, we do have nuclear. 
um, but more intermittency on renewables is assumed, much more limited biomass if you look, because there is quite a lot of concern about biomass with respect to biodiversity in respecting competition with food. So in this scenario, we have ch made a change case, but you can see that similar objectives can be achieved. One needs efficiency. That's why almost one would call for an efficiency revolution and a fundamental change in the system over this time frame. Um, we have assumed that inter, uh, renewables would be more intermittent here, so much more gas to provide virtual backup for nuclear and for renewables, and lots of CCS. So it's one of, if you cannot, you cannot forego all of the options if this is the transformational pathway on which we want to be. You can afford to have one, not work out, but not all of them. But that's not enough, and my story now is a little bit more not about supply that we usually talk, but about the end use. This is where the biggest changes would have to be, and I would just like to show it to you um, symbolically. These are the, our three major sectors that need energy services, industry, buildings, transport. We would have to make radical changes on all of the three sectors. Uh, retrofit industry, go to really efficient products, do the same thing in residential sectors, go to zero energy houses and even plus energy houses that produce themselves electricity and energy beyond what they need, and the transport. For example, 50% improvement in efficiency. We already have vehicles that can do that, but we don't have the lifestyles that can make that possible. So this is a, a complex story, not only of technologies, but also about institutions and policy frameworks. But I, I want to emphasize that the changes would have to be throughout the system, in particular in the end use. And the Secretary General for the 2012, which is the year of sustainable energy for all, has called for very similar goals, universal access for everybody by 2030, so everybody has access to energy, doubling the efficiency improvement and doubling the share of renewables from about 15% to 30%. And as you can see, almost by coincidence, even though this work did fed, feel, feed into these goals, uh, these scenarios that I've shown you do fulfill those goals. These are short-term policies, and you can see how challenging and aspirational this would be. But I think even if you achieve a small share of that, that would be great news. Now, how can we achieve that? And that's uh, the second part of my talk, uh, shorter than the first. Uh, we need research and development in energy, and we need vigorous investments for diffusion and deployment of technologies. So why do we need that? Well, here's an image of how much carbon capture and storage we might, we might need across this kind of futures. Spaghetti curves shows you the range, how much we would cumulatively separate, going all the way up to 2,500 billion tons. Compare that to our endowment, endowment of 1,750 oh, billion tons. So this would be a very fossil-intensive scenario with incredible amount of removal of carbon. We would need to commercialize the technology. We only have pilot plants today, even all of the components we know how to operate, but not scale-up has not been achieved. That would be ahead of us, and who knows what problems might occur when we try to do that. Technology is very uncertain. So maximum storage might be 2,500 billion tons. Remember, atmosphere was just over 3,000, so you cannot afford any leakage <laughs> if you're storing that much. The less one stores, the better in some ways, and I've shown you some scenarios where you can store zero. But you cannot forego, as I was arguing, more than two or three of those options. So let me just... Um, as an illustration, show you how might this happen. How could we improve the technology sufficiently to have that metaphor of declining cost of railway transport? This is a Japanese program, so-called Sunshine Program, that was one of the first in the photovoltaic area and a very unique data set. On the horizontal scale, you can see what, what Japan invested in that first push of photovoltaic cells, about one billion cumulative investment. Vert vertical scale gives you unit costs, yen per watt, peak. And you can see that at the beginning, when there was lots of basic R&D here, the improvements were not all that great. But as, as soon as they started doing applied research, basic research, and actually deployment, investment at in the same time, in niche markets, all of a sudden, the costs declined by 30% per doubling of the investment. So this was a huge... Huge success, and that story is continuing. Photovoltaic costs are going down. People are talking about a possible brick wall, but so far the costs have been going down, and the silicon bubble did help. 
for a next decline in the costs. So they're becoming ever affordable. My colleague, Greg Nemeth, uh, studied some of the reasons for that. And I just wanted to show you how important it is to look at various facets of technological change. So he has concluded that, for example, 40% of the improvement has to do with upscaling, with economies of scale plant size. Then efficiency plays a role and the cost of silicon. And the others are more marginal contributions, but you have to do all of those if you really want to improve the technology. Another great successful example from renewables is the Brazilian ethanol program. Even though it had, I think, many, many problems, the end result is very impressive. The green curve is the cost of ethanol in Brazil over the last 30 years. The red curve is the cost of gasoline. And you can see that the two are competitive. And uh, this was not an easy task. Um, note below, 50 billion cumulative investment of the Brazilian society between what the ethanol cost and, and, and gasoline weight was much cheaper. So it needs also determined, determined policy frameworks. And uh, that is not guaranteed, because over, sustaining this over 20, 30 years is really a tall order. Uh, how did the Brazilians do it? If one decom decomposes that into various components of the cost, they're shaded in different colors, for example, you know, land management, soil preparation, crop maintenance on the bottom, crane transportation. They had huge improvements in all of these components to drive the cost down. And there were lots of social frictions. I will not go into the details, but it was also socially painful. For example, replacing manual labor by mechanized labor and so on. Uh, so this was the second important thing, so getting the supply and the system correct. But perhaps more importantly is not this technology push, but rather demand pull. And they were very smart to legislate um, about five years ago that all of the vehicles need to be flex vehicles, that they can shift at free will between ethanol and gasoline in any proportion that the consumer wants, thereby guaranteeing a very competitive market. And so the point that I'm trying to make, this is basically one of the important concluding remarks before I show you some of the benefits of this transformation, is that the technological change should not be seen as a linear process. You know, very often we naively think here is R&D and there is early investment and then deployment. In fact, like in the Japanese case or in Brazilian case, it's a very interactive, holistic process. You need R&D to in interact all the time with early market formation to drive the cost down. Maybe you have to have subsidies in form of feed-in tariffs or some other policies. And then, then you need quite lots of social accept acceptance and in institutional arrangements. So this is symbol uh, supposed to symb symbolize that, that you need lots of interactive and the right policies. So it's as much about institutions and social change as it is about software and orgware. And here are some of the examples, zero emission bus. Hydrogen, if that's made from zero carbon, hybrid bus, that would get us a long way forward in mobility. But this is, I think, really what we need to do in, in mobility from the World Business Council on Sustainable Development. Imagine such a bus on the right with 50 people. What kind of difference does it make in urban areas compared to the 50 people with their cars? And it's usually just one person per car nowadays. So even if they're hydri uh, electric or hybrid, the congestion is still there. So we need that, but this is not enough. We might need some revolutions. I always was a little bit charmed by it since Toyota presented this idea, kind of, but it would need new infrastructures, and I think we would have to get used to it. But this is basically zero energy vehicle, and it's biodecomposable, and it goes up, so you're at the level of the bicyclist, so you're not disturbing people who walk and bicycle around. So we have to think about really fundamental changes. But this is also not enough. We also need infrastructures, and I think this is, at least from my point of view, a really important, really important uh, conclusion that I would like to make as we look forward. And remember, urbanization. So in the insert, you see a study from EPRI uh, that's called Supergrid. So in, in reality, we need smart grids for the local applications, you know, internet-like systems, but we also need supergrids to concentrate energy to the large urban conglomerations, and this is a study from Japan. You can see solar power in the Gobi Desert, 
being transported by this kind of a supergrid. The supergrid would have um, cryogenic hydrogen or methane going through a pipeline and cooling superconductive cable. And so there are many, many studies ongoing, and there are many experiments, a number of superconductive cables already deployed around the world. And then you have a maglev there. And curiously enough, Japan this year has decided to build maglev between Osaka and Tokyo. So that's another major, major development. And just think about Fukushima tragedy. In the, in, the, in the aftermath of the, of the earthquake and tsunami, if they had a grid, it would have been much easier for Japan. Uh, I think there is one, so to say, con uh, consolation coming out of that. Japan is embarking on a very aggressive energy efficiency program. So I think we will learn quite a lot how to do this effectively out of the crisis that they're emerging because they lost so much of the generating capacity that cannot be restored all that easily. Now we can do a lot at home. This is another example. Uh, on the left, you see a house that was built during the socialist days in Czechoslovakia, not very efficient. I would say also not very attractive. And then with the EU funding, it was retrofitted on the right. I think it looks much nicer. I'm, I'm told it's also much nicer on the inside. And basically 90% cut in the energy requirements. Now, if you consider that worldwide about 40% of energy goes into the buildings, even if you just cut by 50%, we don't have to do 90 because it might be too costly, but 50 is relatively easy. We can half, half through the efficiency measures the amount of energy we need in the buildings. So that's uh, basically some of the examples. So we need quite a lot of technology de development, and for that, that will not happen without investment. So I want to conclude with the two, two investment stories. That's the end of my talk. The first one, and you will probably, if you don't work in the energy area, you might be surprised that it was very difficult to put this together. Uh, quite a lot of people worked on it. We have only partial data. But here is one of the results. Um, and I'm showing you total below, and then only three categories, not all of the, I'm not showing you nuclear and fossils, just want to give you an example. So what are we spending on innovation, energy R&D, and, and deplo early deployment? 50 billion worldwide, maybe it's a bit more, but it's not fundamentally more. About, it, it fell down public, energy R&D fell down to about 12 billion, worldwide after declining for 15 years. And during the last few years, there has been a very welcome reversal, let's say to about almost 20 billion. So 30 billion are from the private sector. Now the access story, the 3 billion people I was talking about get only one, 1 billion, perhaps even less in R&D. So all of the cook stove programs and so on, I, I don't think that you know, we are doing enough to bring that technology to those people and make it compatible with their lifestyles. Renewables and efficiency, you can see together about 20 billion. Now, market formation is very important. That's the early, early development phase. This is where you have those incredible cost reductions, if you're lucky, of course, that I was showing you for photovoltaics and ethanol program. We cannot expect to have that in, in all of the technologies, but without investing in the early market deployment, we will not have them at all. I mean, at least I would argue that. So the, the opposite argument doesn't work. So we have to invest, and hopefully we will be successful. Today, that's about three times as much as R&D, this early deployment where you have the biggest improvements in efficiency and performance of technology, and hopefully also acceptability. That, that clearly, these two numbers have to be increased. And there are many studies that show, indicate that a threefold increase might be on order. And then what are the present investments? 1,250 billion, roughly speaking. These are just very rough numbers. Uh, let's say about 1.2 trillion. I think in the aftermath of the financial crisis, the number doesn't sound any more shocking, but it's still a huge number. It is. That's what we invest in the energy systems. About 500 billion goes to efficiency and renewables. The rest goes to the fossils, and only 9 billion to access. Um, now. Uh, what would we need for the type of scenarios I've shown you? And we have done very, very careful estimates. Well, another 500 billion extra to do it. Um, so that's quite a lot. On the other hand, we give 500 billion for energy subsidies today. So in principle, it's compatible with the capital flows. But I think there is one huge problem. And uh, I, I would like to explicitly mention that, that these investments are all private sector. 
I mean, either by private individuals or by companies, end use in supply. Now, the huge benefits that I would like to show you in conclusion from this transformation are social benefits. We all would benefit. And the problem is how to make the private sector uh, be able to appropriate these benefits that the transformation brings. We don't have the mechanisms for that. These are high upfront investments that do not appear to be attractive for people who are walking to the boardroom or want to look good on the stock market, increase the shareholder value. That doesn't look good today, so we would need some institutional changes to make these long-term investments lucrative. And we have an example that it actually worked, nuclear energy. You might be surprised that I'm mentioning nuclear, but nuclear was a great success from that point of view. We invested in very capital-intensive technology. Most of the power plants that are operating since they've been built more than 20 years ago have been paid for. Therefore, now it's a relatively cheap source of energy. And many of the things I'm talking about, including efficiency and renewables, have very similar characteristics. High upfront costs, but very low costs later on. So you have to somehow overcome this skill, and for that we don't have the institutional arrangements. And um, let me conclude by showing you an example of the, of the work from my colleagues. They show why it might be a good idea to do this from the point of view of what kind of co-benefits one would have. So let me just explain you what you're seeing here. There are three goals here shown in these triangles on top of the figure. Uh, climate change, let's say achieving two degrees, uh, reducing pollution to improve health down to zero, and increasing energy security. And I will not go into the details, but basically diversifying the energy system, having more storage, and so on. So these are the three, three angles. Uh, then the first column you see says only energy security. That would cost, on the vertical scale, about 0.2% of the GDP. That's our estimate. To improve energy security around the world, diversify more, and so on. To reduce the air pollution is costly, about three times as much. Um, much of that is done today with the end of the pipe technologies. We put catalytic converters. We arrest particulate matter from the uh, burning of, of solid fuels and so on. Um, so that's another set of policies that we to have today. And then the third set of policies that we would have is to curb climate change. So if the objective was only to do climate change, a typical order of magnitude is about 1% of GDP, maybe 08 in this particular case. Now, how about if we try to do everything at the same time? Because clearly there are synergies among these policies. And um, the different color shadings show you different ambition levels. So if you want to fulfill all of the objectives at the same time, so stabilizing at two degrees, eliminating air pollution, and in, in enhancing energy security around the world, then you can see it would be well above 1% of GDP. Uh, what that would cost, but, but you can see here what the benefits would be. In fact, the difference between only doing climate and doing all of the goals is relatively marginal if you compare it what the cost would be of doing everything independently. And I think that's a part of the tragedy of our, so that's a Halloween story, a little scary story, that most of our policies are made independently of each other and therefore we cannot, uh, that we cannot reap these potential benefits and co-benefits of the transformation. So I hope this was not too dense. For, for an evening talk on Halloween, and I look forward to hearing your questions, comments, and observations. Thank you very much. Hi, uh, Rasha Kumar, International Energy Efficiency Network. Um, I had a question about what would you recommend as the sort of the best technologies to address that three billion people who don't have energy? Like, like what is the solution for them? It seems like things like PV solar may make sense, even though it's you know it's more expensive than it would be for other things, but more appropriate there. Yeah, frankly speaking, you know, th this is not my, my area. I rely on the work of many colleagues who are real experts in that area, and the, grow the community around the world is really expanding. And you have to have quite lots of knowledge on the ground. It is not, I think, part of the reasons why many of the recipes so far didn't work is because they were not compatible, what was happening on the ground. And um, let me just sh go back to the picture I've shown you wh while I speak. If you might remember those people loading up their telephones. Now... I tried to allude to that while I was speaking about it. Uh, so in many ways, I think when we think about developing countries, in may, uh, very often we are thinking about the 
repeating the development paradigm that we had here. And that's probably the wrong way. Uh, that's the picture. That's probably the wrong way of, of, of seeing it. So as I mentioned, these people are paying quite a lot for, for, for the little electricity that they use. They actually don't have it, only for the mobile phones. Now there are schemes, and colleague Vijay Modi from Columbia University and many others are working on that. For example, in Mali, they have built a very small experimental solar power plant. And, you know, calling it power plant is a misnomer in many ways. It's a two kilowatt unit. It's a two kilowatt unit. And the virtue of that is it combines the modern technology. You see these people have mobile phones. So basically the idea is a two kilowatt unit. A wire goes from the center all the way to, 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 uh, to houses. And, um, and then by a mobile phone, people can look what the cost is of the service right now, and through the, through the mobile phone, they can then pay a certain amount of fractions of a kilowatt to put a light bulb or charge their phone. And um, so all of a sudden, you know, with the amount they're paying per kilowatt, they can actually have a very reliable service, and they can also monitor the price. Um, and, you know, the system is relatively fault-free because each house is connected separately. There is also a little uh, lead-acid battery in the, in, the, in the hut that has a solar, uh, solar panel so that you would have after, after daylight uh, electricity as well. And it's economic. People are willing to pay. The problem, again, is the same problem I mentioned before, is the capital cost up front. So you need some kind of financing mechanisms. But once it's financed, the, 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 the costs would be carried by the people because they're already paying that much for almost no service, an unreliable service. And then there is another component that I think those of us who live in a really well institutionalized societies do not remember. I do from my childhood. Electricity bill is an important thing to have if you don't have anything else. You don't have an ID, you, you know. Electricity bill is a kind of a proof of credit worthiness, that you're a serious person, that you're paying your electricity. And, and so it's really also important to the people. So it brings more than just a, a, a copper wire into the home. And I, I just brought that example. That's on electrification. And clearly, that only covers the service of some lighting and, and the mobile phones, because they cannot afford too many kilowatts. So they still have to cook with, with the biomass. And for that, we need new efficient stoves. I know people in this country, like Kirk Smith, who is working on efficient uh, stoves that would also have photovoltaic cells. It would be kind of with a blower, because you need to circulate the air. That stove, apparently, uh, in some configuration, that particular design even wouldn't need a chimney. It would clean up the, the particulate matter, and the nice thing is it would have also photovoltaic cells somewhere so that the man of the house can still charge his telephone, <laughs> and maybe that would be one of the purchasing motivations. Uh, so there are solutions like that, and um, let me just conclude. Uh, I'm sorry for taking too long to answer your question. That. Uh, my colleagues at the ASA have looked in great detail how that could be financed. Uh, they don't believe that subsidies alone will do it. You need some subsidies. They believe that uh, a good combination of microcredit and subsidies could do it. That, that this is a, so you need a combination of policies to bring the cooking stoves and electricity to, to the villages. The, uh one thing you didn't say a lot about are the political dimensions of how you get to these solutions. The costs and benefits um, that you showed in the last mm -hmm. slide are, as aggregated, yeah. are distributed quite unevenly over the globe and then there are discounting issues. Can you say something about strategies to, uh, to, uh, to achieve, starting with local and regional strategies and working up to the international agreements? Well, that, that's a really good question, Simon. And, you know, much of the work that our colleagues at YASA do and elsewhere does, does have regional detail. And our major challenge now is to bring it even lower down. So the work, for example, on the GAINS model at YASA would be also looking at the much higher resolutions. Uh, but still, you know, I, I think since the analysis comes more, let's call it from the technical feasibility point of view, it doesn't really enter deeply into those geopolitical and institutional issues that, that you are raising. And um, so I can only give you my private answer, uh, and I will use the word that was popular in this country. I think you need a coalition of the willing. <laughs> you know, I don't think there, there is any 
top-down mechanism. I think the, you know, the agents of change, people who are innovators, who have the vision, like that sailing railway. I think, you know, and I think we have many people like that in the private sector. There are many companies around the world that are thinking what they call green. A number of countries are thinking about the green development, whatever that might mean in, in detail. So I think we need those pioneers of change, people who will experiment. So it's a little bit, an, I'm proposing a little bit of an evolutionary strategy that needs to be nudged by governments. And there where it works well, I think we will have lots of imitation. And I think that's the principle of diffusion. I don't think that the global, personally, I don't believe that the global agreement is possible on those things, but I think great examples are possible, and I think this is where the international community can do quite a lot of catalytic investments, because I think what you need is basically to free up the private, private money until people see that there would be benefits. But as I said before, I think we have to also find some ways of... of br- bridging that gap that that the private sector is willing to make a long-term upfront investments. And we have it even for ourselves. I mean, we are private sector too. We are very often skeptical of making high capital investments in our houses because we don't know how long we will be there. It takes many years to reap the benefits. So I think we have those these kind of principal agent problems throughout the economy, not just in the large business. So I'm, I'm afraid I don't have a good answer to your question. I have a question. Just those comments. I have a question, Pres- yeah, Professor. Please. I'd like to know, since you've had so much exposure to <clears throat> various places and different modalities, uh, have you come up with any ideas yourself that you have been tempted to um, mass produce? Say, for instance, <clears throat> desalinization of water, which is very popular in certain parts of Air, uh, Africa. There's a company called Air to Water, which is trying to meet the, the need for that, puring, pulling water out of air, yeah. moisture. Um, so have you come up with any personal ideas? And then what do you feel are some of the leading companies? I know there's companies like Siemens that are well known for promoting uh, development of, of new ideas and products. But what about here in the U.S.? And can we benefit, can we uh, somehow affect our economy in a, conserv- in a, con- a um, conducive <coughs> way by developing our own technology here? Well, I, I think there are many, many innovative companies around the world, but I, let me give you some what I would call stylized facts. You know, they're not only approximately right. I think that much of the innovation, as we'll see, in my view, will not be coming from the largest of the, of the agents and companies. I think it will be coming for many of the small entrepreneurs. But you need the large companies for the scale-up for the, and the, for the massive diffusion. So I think there are a couple of stages. I think the, the good ideas and the innovate, innovative ideas... You know, these are companies like Tesla Motors that later on get lots of funding from the larger agents. But the, the basic ideas, in my view, occur very often in small innovative organizations. And then, then when it comes to the, that could be for that niche market development I was talking about, early deployment. But then for the true scale-up, and you have seen it in case of ethanol as well as photovoltaics, but it's also true for wind, wind power. Uh, the big the big improvements also uh, happen through through economies of scale, making all of the units larger, you know producing it in larger batches so for that you need really industrial scale operation companies like Siemens and so on so i don 't think there is any s- a single single recipe and then you know when you ask about this country, I mean there was huge amount of renewable energy being installed here. I think you had lots of problems with the financial crisis worldwide investment went back and one we shouldn 't forget that um, you know China is a major player it 's becoming a real major player and they, they are the biggest producer of photovoltaic cells, and they have one of the most uh, ambitious efficiency programs. China wants to continue reducing their energy intensity about 4% per year. This is, this is astoundingly high goal. So I think that uh, in innovation, I think like good ideas, exist everywhere. The question is where you would have the best institutional arrangements. And I, I, would, I would argue that China is pushing that agenda very strongly. Then um, I think if one goes to Korea, Korea is also very ambitious about their green growth, trying to go launch the efficiency, you know, 
know, the lead light bulbs or the efficient technologies. So I think we will see that everywhere. I don't think it will be unique to any particular geographic area, but um, I think the, the problem is really how to start it. And I think that we had in the earlier development phases exactly the same challenge it takes. I would, my conclusion from asking the question would be a slightly different answer. I think perhaps the biggest constraint for this transformation is the time. Because historically these things took decades and I don't think that we have decades for achieving some of those goals. Yes, please. Yeah. I need a microphone or I'll just, I'll just speak up. Okay. Um, I was always taught that energy is neither created nor destroyed. It just yes. changes form. Yes. On an astronomical time scale, yes. the temperature of the Earth is a balance of the energy received from the sun and lost by the Earth, apart from some nuclear going on inside the core. So how does human activity influence all of that? Well, I mean, I think there are many facets to your questions. I mean, I mean, it is true, energy is not destroyed, but, you know, what Europeans call exergy, exergy is destroyed. Entropy is increasing, so we are degrading energy, and that's part of our challenge, you know, to have the highest efficiency as we do that. Uh, and um, uh, there are a number of studies that I'm familiar with that look into that, into the, I mean, that's a partial answer to your question into, you know, how could theoretically most efficient system look like compared to today's system? And if you did, did everything right within the boundary conditions, and the conclusion might be a factor of 10. So efficiency is a resource like coal, like wind, like uranium. Uh, so there is a huge potential. So I think that's partial answer to your question. We could theoretically provide all of the energy services with the primary energy we are doing, uh, using today for all of the humanity. So in theory, we do not have to interfere with the planetary processes more. Now, to my knowledge, you know, the energy balance of the Earth is only you know, infinitesimally affected with our without energy consumption. Don't forget that solar insulation is about 10,000 ti 10, times larger than total energy flows of our commercial energy system today. But I, the interference is more in the other areas that are, go beyond, so to say, what I work on on a daily basis. Um, climate is certainly one of those. I mean, the, it's the emissions that are influencing the system. And I would say in the ecosystems and other spheres, the influence is much larger. And energy is an important component on that. So I wouldn't see the, the problems. When I started working, and uh, Jerry might remember that, one of the questions in the 70s was not clear whether we would be also affecting the energy balance. But in those days, people were thinking of astronomical future energy needs. And the last 30 years have shown that efficiency has brought those expectations much down. Let's take one more question. We'll take two more questions. Why don't we ask them both, and that was, those will be the last two. You start. Now, you talked about running out of time. What role do you see geoengineering uh, playing in decarbonization? And also, uh, Pablo, did you have a question? Do we take two? Yeah, two, we'll take two. Uh, I'd like to come back to the water and energy feedback. The gentleman over there was uh, pointing to that. Right now, there's about 4,000 cubic kilometers fresh water needed for agriculture. By 2050, I'm going to the most uh, conservative scenario of the Asa and World Bank to feed those people which will be there. We will need 2,000 cubic kilometers more. The water is not there. We have to get it from the sanitation. A lot of energy will go to this 2,000 kilometer of cubic the water we need. The price of the desalination right now, cubic meter, is about $25. We need to go down to $1 to feed the agriculture we need there. Did you account for these big numbers in the energy system? Which, of course, will be the main energy user. That is a part of the story. Uh, well, in some ways, the, uh, for me, the, the questions are similar. They both deal with geoengineering in some sense. You know, how to do the water for the agriculture. I think agriculture is the major geoengineering operation we have had on this planet since we emerged out of the Neolithic Revolution. But just to talk about specific geoengineering, I think, you know, the idea is, is from, from my point of view, goes very far back. 
to, to the early uh, studies of, of um, climate change. I see Bob Frosch sitting in the, in the back row. He was one of the great innovators of that idea in the first in the first Academy report, if I remember correctly. It was even then, and I think that continues to be the case today, in his estimates then, and I think in most of the studies today, it's one of the cheapest options, but the problems are somewhere else. I think they're not in the cost, they're not in the you know, technical feasibility. I think the problems are more what unintended consequences might come out of those measures. And this continues to be the biggest challenge, and therefore I would argue it's a technology of the last resort. After we try everything and it doesn't work, then maybe we will have to do that. So I think it's important to do research in that area. But I'm certainly skeptical as to the, uh, as to the possibility of really unintended events that go would go beyond the scale of what we might be doing with the biomass or carbon storage and other similar technologies. And by the way, personally, I wouldn't include CCS in the category of geoengineering. Some people do that. I, I, you know, you're storing it underground. I mean, it is geoengineering. But I was thinking, for me, geo geoengineering class that I'm a little bit reserved about is mostly influencing radiative forcing. And I think this is where we have to be very cautious. But I, I would fu fully s I, I support strongly the idea that we need to get know-how and do R&D in those areas, because who knows whether we would need it. Um, on water, Pavel, I have to admit that we did not look at that. And I think that's something for the, for the future story. Um, when we did the type of scenarios that I've shown you before, these transformational scenarios, this did include land use components because you need a biomass. And basically the way the colleagues at YASA did that is, you know, they would run our agricultural model and, and look how much food is there, what the prices would be, and then we connected with the energy model and tried to exchange, exchange biomass and the energy crops at some exchange price with a priority that first the, land, the best land goes to agriculture and what's left over goes to energy. And so indirectly they looked at the water requirements, but that's nothing of the sort that you're talking about. And uh, I think this is the next level of integration for, our, uh, for I think, the, the community in the future to look at the same time at water, you know, food, and energy in an integrated way. And because you need energy for water, you need energy for food, and vice versa. So a little bit like the co benefit slide I showed at the end between three energy objectives, I think we need to do it for food and water in the three dimensions. So that's something that maybe ASA can consider doing. <clears throat> 